It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. All right, welcome everyone back to the Kriya Yoga Podcast. Uh, today, I'm here with a very special guest, Reverend Priya Friday Pabros. Um, she is the director of the Meditate and Thrive Kriya Yoga Center, which is now uh, open physically in Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, she is a teacher within the Kriya Yoga tradition where she learned from Yogacharya Ellen Grace O'Brien and was ordained by her. And I know many of you already know that um, Yogacharya O'Brien is a student of Roy Eugene Davis um, and a, a, sister, uh, a sister spirit uh, in this tradition. So uh, without any more delay, uh, welcome Priya. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you. It's a joy to be here with you. Yeah, yeah. I've been wanting to connect with you for a while, and now here we are. And um, before we before we get into the actual conversations we're going to have today, if you don't mind um, telling a little bit about yourself. For example, uh, how did you discover Kriya Yoga, and, and how did you get involved with uh, the Kriya Yoga meditation path? Sure, sure. So, um, like many of us, I discovered Kriya Yoga through autobiography of a yogi. I uh, was living in New York, and I always frequented the metaphysical bookstores. And, you know, I've always been curious about different traditions and um, the tradition that I grew up in, which was Christianity. Uh, served me well because my parents were um, really clear about um, spirituality being uh, not a personal choice per se, because they wanted us all to be Christians, but, you know, that you had to journey uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. So I felt free to visit and other churches and all of that. But then I discovered Autobiography of a Yogi, and as many people have said, the consciousness and energy of Yogananda just exudes from that book. And I felt instant recognition, grabbed it, bought it, went home, read it, I don't know how many times, and thought, this is my path. Of course, unfortunately, I said, where is this guy? And I <laughs> found out that he was no longer embodied. <laughs> so um, I sought out SRF and did the lessons and, you know, went, did everything I could. Mm -hmm. to embark on the path. Mm -hmm. But at the conclusion of those studies, I found that I really wanted a living teacher. Mm -hmm. I needed a living teacher, and I really wanted a living teacher in the tradition of Paramahansa Yogananda. So I set that prayer out to the universe, and uh, was probably it was 20 years later, that I found my teacher, but I always held that in my heart that I would find a living teacher in this tradition. I practiced on my own, um, not always very well or very dedicated, but once I found my teacher, I was rock solid. 20 years. Well, now that's devotion. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. I mean, I, just, I, just, I love hearing that. <laughs> so, well, that brings up an, an, an interesting point, um, because the idea of having a teacher, having having a guru, especially an embodied one, um, before we got, get to that, I'm kind of curious. So you learned and you practiced and, and you were you were also before you found uh, Yogacharya O'Brien, um, you 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 were able to to make progress e even in that time w without having a teacher, correct? Yes, yes, because you know the teachings were really clear. Mm -hmm. Yogananda's um, the study lessons were great, mm -hmm. um, and I just kept trying to meditate. Um, I wouldn't say I was really great at it, but I wasn't leaving the path. I just knew that I wasn't leaving this path. I was going to do whatever I could. Yeah, yeah. Well, before, before I forget, I, I just want to stay with this a little bit longer. Um, you know, people are always, you know, contacting me or others asking about finding, um, you know, a living Kriya Yoga teacher. And based on your experience, 
Do you have any words of advice for them about how to continue to cultivate their path and persist, even if they haven't found their teacher yet, even if they haven't found the teacher in 10 years or 15 years? I mean, it, you stayed for 20 years, so that's, that is, that is fantastic, which means that you've got experience. What would you say to people who are, who are looking? Well, I would say that, you know, you have to trust the teachings you know, to um, access the teachings, do the practices as as they're taught, uh, because it's out there, the information is out there, as you know, and as you're providing. Um, and just trust that your inner teacher is awakening, and when the time is right, if your heart's desire is to find a living teacher, just put yourself in places where you can you can encounter that and continue to practice. That's what I would say. Yeah, good. And what was it like? Uh, wh- how did you discover uh, Yogacharya O'Brien? W- and what was that like to to finally, after twenty years, you know, meet your teacher and then have that experience? It was amazing. Um, you know, I went through a lot of different things in those twenty years, but I've still held it that vision. And um, once I had moved to California, um, I had. In the newspaper, there was a, a little ad in the religious services section for CSE. Mm-hmm. And they had and just... That's that, that Center for Spiritual Enlightenment. Yes. Yes, Ellen Center. Yes, go ahead. Yes. And they had just moved to the site where they are now, that beautiful ashram. Mm-hmm. And I saw it and it said, Awaken to the one truth known by many names. Mm-hmm. And I said, Hey... That's what I always say. (laughs) That's my motto. So I had to go check it out. Yeah. yeah. So I I arrived there. And do you know that it was probably at least two weeks before I actually met Yogacharya O'Brien? Oh, no. She was away when I arrived on the grounds. And I went to a worship service. It was around Christmas. And I went to um, their worship service for the holy days. And I thought, wow, I love this place. What is this place? And I wasn't a joiner. I did not know it was a Kriya Yoga Center. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'll hang out here until I find what I'm really looking for, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So she came back after about two weeks and was offering a class on chakras. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, who's this lady? (laughs) (laughs) I went to the class. And as soon as she started talking, I thought, Oh, there's something here. There's something, you know, I felt her words going directly to my heart. And I thought, wow, is this really happening? Am I really finding my teacher? So the class was like four weeks. I sat in the back in the corner and I thought, let me not, you know, get too excited. Let me just check it out and see if this is really it. And um, it really was. (laughs) Well, what's funny about that in your story is I've heard many people say, that they made their way to Center for Spiritual Enlightenment and they didn't know it was a Kriya Yoga Center until later. Yeah. yeah. That's well, fascinating. at that time, you know, it, back in, at that time, it was uh, 1999, you know, it wasn't very obvious that it was. I mean, right now you would know that it's a Kriya Yoga Center. Right. But back then it wasn't very obvious. And um, I was a little confused about how she was my teacher and it wasn't a Kriya Yoga Center. But <laughs> but it was. <laughs> yeah. The teachings were certainly in line with all of it. But I was in the back of the sanctuary and I happened to see it was like a small picture of Yogananda. Mm-hmm. And that was really the, the only outward sign at the time. Mm-hmm. And I said, Hey, what's he doing on your wall? <laughs> <laughs> That's my teacher. Yeah. Well, oh, nice. So what, what was the response? That what was the response that when you they asked said, that? Well, question? this is a Kriya Yoga Center, and that's our our tradition. I thought, well, duh. That's yeah. why I'm here. Perfect, perfect. And then, so so you showed up around 1999, and then um, you, you went through the the Marrow Institute and got a Master's of Divinity. Is that I correct? did. Yeah, I tried to sign up right away, and uh-huh. they said, "Well, wait a minute. Yeah. Would you like to be initiated? Would you like?" <laughs> right. You know, but yeah. Yeah, I went to the seminary. And um in your own uh in your own ministry and in, in your own teaching, um what what do you find to be um something that that, that some advice that you would give to individuals who are 
just finding the path and beginning on the path, number one. And then, you know, as you get to know students better, as you get to interact with them more um, and they become more long-term meditators, uh, what advice do you give to them to help to help stay the course? Well, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm really encourage people to trust the teachings mm -hmm. and to um, seek direct experience so that you can verify the teachings. And then the rest takes care of itself. You know, once you find how effective and powerful this path and practice is, you know, it, it works itself from the inside out and, and uh, progress happens. Yeah. And, and, and in that way, it's paying attention to what is written about, say, in the Yoga Sutras and also the meditation techniques. By doing those things, it happens naturally. Yes, and to really trust that it's going to happen because it does take time. Yeah. And often people want it to happen right now. Right. You know, and I also let people know that it's not a path where you are going to say a mantra or sit, you know, once a week and make progress. Mm -hmm. You have to really dedicate yourself. You have to really want it. Right, right. And so it's, that's uh, most I mean, I like I like that. I, it just so happens last night I was um, I happened to, to click on a YouTube video. It was, it was an interview with a um, an, uh, a woman in, uh, Indian mystic, and they were asking her how to develop gratitude. And mm -hmm. she just said, she just said, it comes on its own. You don't have to do anything. And and everything they asked her, you know, how do you develop this? She says, if you just practice, it comes on its own. You, you don't have to do anything. So it sounds like you're you're essentially mirroring the same the same thing I was just listening to. Yeah, it's it's difficult to hear that though for yeah. many people new on the path because they're like, how, when do I know? How do I know it's come? And I'm like, right. oh, you'll know. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and for those for those who have have been practicing for a while and they are dedicated, you know that because they meditate every day and they study every day. But what I've seen is sometimes we all still get a little impatient um, for for the long longer term meditators, longer term practitioners. How do you help them to? How do you help them just continue to get over that hump? What, what kind of continued inspiration uh, would you recommend for them? Well, what my guru always tells me is sometimes you need to bring a little juice to your practice. Sometimes it feels dry. Sometimes you feel like, I've been doing this for so many years. There are um, many ways to bring juice to your practice. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, I love kirtan and I mm -hmm. love devotional practices. And I find that for me, often, I just need to up my devotional practice and get my heart into it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's too much in the head about, you know, what do I need to know? And, you know, what do I need to study? And sometimes you just need to surrender to yeah. what is right. and be um, in joy about it. So sometimes it takes a little devotion practice to get to that joy. Yeah. And, and speaking of, of Kirtan, I mean, you are a a quite uh, amazing, uh, accomplished singer as well. Is that Thank you? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, can we, um, would it be okay if we featured one, one of your recordings in this podcast? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, do you have access to that right now? Well, not at the moment, but hopefully, oh, okay. hopefully you can give it to me and then I can, I can add it in at the end, at the end of the recording. <laughs> All right. Very good. Yeah. That'd be great. We probably should do, um, well, you'll, you'll see. Floated in Elm is, is a good one. Okay. Um, okay. I think because it, it draws from the instruction to not waste the um, energy and beauty of contemplating and um, meditating on Aum, mm -hmm. but to abide in that after effect and to allow yourself to float your goals, your desires, your concerns, your cares in the om. Just give it over, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like they say in uh, New Thought, give it over to God. And, you know, it, it's kind of the same. So that song came out of that instruction. And it is um, highlighting the fact that if we hold a high vision for our world, for our life and all of that, and give it over in prayer or to the energy of Om, the field of all possibility, that we will see things manifest in the right way. 
Yeah. And let's, let's put that at the end of the podcast, but can you tell me what is the name of that track again? Float it in Om. Float it in Om. Okay. So those of you who are, who are listening, uh, we will include this recording at the end of the podcast. And um, also within the, uh, the, the notes of the podcast, uh, I'll include contact information for your music where people can find that. Because it's I, I, you sent me a few recordings and I listened to it and I was, I was, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, I'm a singer. And you think, yeah, that's nice. But you definitely, <laughs> you, you embody music. So awesome. it, it's Thanks. going to be worthwhile for people to find that. Um, on that same kind of note, though, with the idea of OM, I, I really feel that that is an important part of the Kriya Yoga tradition that it's talked about often, um, but I don't. I don't always see people giving it enough emphasis. And even in um, Sri Yukteswar's Holy Science, there's this emphasis on uh, baptizing oneself in Om. So if, if you don't mind, I'm curious, um, how, do you, how do you recommend people to become aware of that? What are some tips or techniques you have to help people tap into that? experience in a, in a meditation practice yes yeah yeah well i begin with giving them something really practical um, and that is to of course listen to and for inner sound but to allow that sound to eclipse the inner dialogue so i um, offer them this idea that you can quiet everything and bring on to the foreground you know mm -hmm. and then if you're not hearing what you think you should hear that would be om itself you know i always do what sri devishji did and say just equate or um equate what you hear with om and contemplate om so i also you know speak about you know what om represents and to contemplate that as you do so mm -hmm. and to just listen within mm -hmm. But so, really allow whatever you hear to eclipse any dialogue about it. So it's, it's a focus on sound and letting your awareness be absorbed in in sound. And if you hear what you think is the Aum, wonderful. But if you don't, whatever comes in and out of your awareness as sound, focus on that. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good because as... You, you and I know everything is OM anyway, so yes. <laughs> even if you're listening to the car going by, it's still OM. Um, so that's good. And then you had mentioned to contemplate on the, the meaning of OM and what, what OM represents. Yes. So for those, of, uh, for those in the audience who are listening, um, can you describe what is that? So we'll give them a sense of, of what that means. Yeah. So it, it is described as the evidentiary aspect of God, mm -hmm. right? So that is the um, representation of the power and energy of the creative force moving into manifestation. Mm -hmm. So for like a simple explanation, although this is not what it is, I say you could equate it with the remaining vibration of the Big Bang if you like. Mm -hmm. You know, to just kind of take it out of the um, the esoteric for a moment to say, you know, you could kind of equate it with that if you like, <laughs> mm -hmm. just to access it. Right. Um, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And then the, I guess, final phase of that in, in regards to what we're discussing today, the idea of uh, floating one's um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thoughts and wishes and, and so on in Om. Can you talk a little bit more about how that how that how that works what it is and how to do it yeah when i'm practicing that aspect i'm thinking of om as the field of all possibility mm. where um and then if i envision my um whatever i'm holding mm -hmm. that i need to float in om most often it's a uh, not a concern but it is a a goal or a desire or something you want to know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, when I envision lifting that up, and so I'm a visual person, mm -hmm. when I envision lifting that up into the field of all possibility, I can imagine it being supported by that energy mm -hmm. in becoming a reality, mm -hmm. whatever it is that I'm holding. 
So that's how it works for me, and that's how I would encourage people to use it. But I think that most of the time, the most effective way is to understand what it is and then you know, try to relate it to your experience so that you can access it. Because mm-hmm. it does sound like kind of woo-woo to a lot of people to, to consider this. Yeah. Well, if you, if you go through a lot of the, the, the texts, you know, the Yoga Sutras and others, when, and even the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the amount of devotion that is required is, I don't know if you would say it seems woo-woo, but it definitely seems uh, very hard to comprehend that it is even possible. <laughs> yes. yes. Sometimes. Yes. Um, and, and actually, we might get to that in a moment. Um, but just so I'm clear and so the audience is clear. So with this idea of, of floating, floating it in Aum, um, after one meditates for a bit and becomes still and then begins to either hear if they can the, the vibration or contemplate however they can attune to experience Aum, then the idea is to... Um, sense or see or feel or even imagine that 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 power or that vibration um whatever the prayer is as though it's 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 given to or absorbed in that 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 power yes yeah well done okay great (laughs) it's always hard to turn things like that into words but um good i think that would be helpful for people um and I'm curious, you know, the the Kriya Yoga path, um, it is a wonderful path of contemplation, of devotion, uh, a wonderful path of awakening. And many times when people become interested and they begin practicing, they have an idea that by doing these things, that it's as if they're... Uh, maybe difficulties in the in the human realm are just going to vanish and sometimes they get a little discouraged when they don't so um, how do you how do you speak to that when when it comes up with with students that you're working with yeah i had that yesterday i was uh teaching a meditation class and someone asked something very similar you know like well am i going to be able to um you know live a carefree life pretty much Mm -hmm. and what I answer is that we are more able to respond to difficulties in life. We're more grounded in ourselves. We understand what is true more readily, and we're less perturbed mm-hmm. by events in our life. We can be more present mm-hmm. for difficulties and for situations that reco- you know, require presence. Mm -hmm. So that's how it supports us with difficulties in our life. But they're not going to go away. Right, right. Um, An interesting uh, interesting thought. You know, I just recently visited with um, uh, Yogacharya O'Brien a a few weeks ago. Actually, maybe it was about a month ago now. And um, she had talked to me about um, environmental issues. And issues being more involved in the world and these types of things. And um, I'm sure you know that Mr. Davis didn't really get into those very much. Uh, he, he was more of a focus on your own practice. You know, if you are, if you have the skills or the capacity or you're involved in a vocation that can help bigger picture things in the world, that's fine. Now, of course, he was interested in protecting the environment and so on. But what I'm trying to build up to here is when it comes to being involved in the world and with the difficulties that we see on the news and things that arise in different situations, I often get emails. People say, well, what can we do? How can I have faith in God if these things can happen? And how can I have faith if these things can happen? And um, I usually don't have a very good answer for that. So I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on that and if you have any advice for people. Yeah, that's a difficult question, Um, often because many people who might ask it, you know, already believe something about it. Mm -hmm. And to turn that around is is firstly difficult. Um, But what I would answer is that these things that are happening in the world, some are attributed to, you know, the natural process of the earth. Mm -hmm. Some are... um, disturbed people doing 
unhelpful things and, mm-hmm. and worse than unhelpful. And um, this is not the realm where God gets involved and stops us doing things or keeps us from doing things or keeps things from happening. Um, we have a world full of people expressing at different levels of consciousness and sometimes <laughs> bad people bump up against each other or up against good people yeah. you know but you know you can have faith because yesterday i was talking to someone about this as well and said <sighs> well you know for a fact that there are let's let's talk about people right now bad people because you know we're having so many things in the news about people doing horrible things mm-hmm. to other people but you know that there are even more good people and you yourself are a good person. You know that good people exist. You know that people are trying to be kind, to be compassionate, to do good things in the world. So let's not spend all of our energy focused on the negativity, but increase the positivity in yourself and around and within others. Right. Well, that, that answer very much um, r- reminds me of what Mr. Davis would say. <laughs> yeah very much and um we won't spend too much time on it because I, I think you, you you covered it very well mm-hmm. um but the, the next just the next uh, aspect of that would be knowing that that's true we we understand that and we can even feel it and we can see it um but still sometimes people have difficulty when they sit to meditate to let let the difficulties go so that they can turn within and focus on Spirit, so that they can focus on their inner work. So I guess the, the the final part of this question is, what do you recommend for individuals to do who may be disturbed by things in the news or things around them when they sometimes can't necessarily immediately do anything about them? What do you recommend that they do in meditation so that they're still able to meditate well, so they're still able to practice well? Well, sometimes it is difficult to meditate um, you know, world events are not. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, there, many practices are offered for um, engaging the mind so that the mind is not wandering or uh, focused on, um, you know, outer conditions. So I would say use the techniques mm-hmm. that still your mind. You can think back to times when you've meditated and you've been able to use the technique to still your mind. Bring that technique back and use it. Know that sometimes emotions will run high, sometimes it will be difficult. And know that it's a period that you will pass through. Mm -hmm. But continue to use the techniques that work for you. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we're, you know, melancholy or sad about events in the world. And it's it's okay to um, feel, you know. But as all the teachers advise to not you know, remain in that, but to do what you know you should do Mm -hmm. to lift yourself up enough to be able to practice. I know it sounds just like, well, go ahead and practice anyway, but really use the techniques that uh, to still your mind so that you can meditate, so that you can be quiet. Often people say, I can't meditate. Um, Often they're not using the techniques to get to it. They're stopping <laughs> before they use them and say, I can't sit and be quiet. And I'm like, we well, use the techniques until you are. Right. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work, but even just sitting in prayer works. Right. At least calm your heart. Yeah. And that, that reminds me also of uh, something Mr. Davis would say. And he would say, the techniques work, but you have to work the techniques. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, thank you for that. Well, I'm sure um, our audience will appreciate it. Um, so in your own life, in your own study, in your own ministry now, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what what aspects of the teaching, what aspects of the philosophy have you been interested in or, or passionate about? What's been going on in that area for you? Mm. Well, I am a big fan. I, I just like to say that, although it's more than that of the Yoga Sutras. Every time I read and study the Yoga Sutras, I get more and more and more and more and more. And I know that seems like just the basics of this path, but it keeps opening up more and more all the time. And I enjoy teaching it because, um, you know, when, when I tried to access it, the Sutras, before I was really meditating deeply, I couldn't quite understand 
what was being said and what was what 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 are you getting at potentially Uh right you know but the more i meditate the more the teachings just open Mm -hmm. for me so yoga sutras is my number one thing to do but um right now i'm really focused on affirmations i'm going Mm -hmm. to do a, a retreat for csc focused on visualization and affirmations um throughout my life i've I think I've been able to access soul guidance maybe more easily than some others that I've known and and even some yogis that I've known. It's just a natural thing for me. So um, I've been able to say to myself what I know to be true, even if I don't feel it in the moment, and to find my way there. So that's what I feel affirmations are if you have faith. Mm-hmm. Um, to say, you know, I don't know this yet in, as a reality in my life, but I have faith in it, so I will affirm it for myself. Yes. And I've been able to do that and find success and to inspire myself. Thank goodness, some, you know, to be able to inspire yourself is really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yes, because you, you're the one that's around all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things about this, though, is the connection with truthfulness, which I think you speak about mm-hmm. often, mm-hmm. At, at least lately. Yes. Truthfulness, um, the, the aspect of the practice that is truthfulness helps, helps with this. Mm-hmm. You know, it helps you not only to speak truth, but to recognize truth and to live in truth. Yeah. Well, that's something I'm passionate about right now. Yeah, that's, that's in my experience, that is the most important thing. Because if you're speaking it and you're doing it, well, you're going to recognize it, as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, something a little off topic, and we'll, we'll get back into it. Um, I'm curious, uh, have you ever had a, a Vedic astrology reading? No, but I'd be interested to do so. Oh, well, I was just curious because the, the way you talk and the way you, you discuss affirmation, affirmations and, and truth and things, it makes me wonder if you have a very good Jupiter because usually <laughs> Jupiter gives access to what you're describing, the ability to, to, to know about this, to, to, to get good guidance in these regards and also get a good guru. So you've already got a good, got a good guru, so we'll assume that you probably do. Um, but anyway... With the idea of affirmations, then, um, I think that's extremely important. And how do you... Well, you'll be doing a retreat with CSC. When will that retreat be? The end of July. The end of July. Okay. I will see if I can get the this video posted before then so people know about it. Um, but if not, send me a link and I will, I will share it. Uh, I will okay. share it for you. Um, for those individuals who who really enjoy affirmation or who are interested in exploring affirmation, um, is there just a simple way that they can begin to work it into their their meditation practice that you would recommend? I would say to really go within and determine what it is that you wish to see in your life the goals you'd like to meet, or even a a change in circumstance. Really contemplate it so that when you are affirming, you're not affirming Mm (laughs) ishy. You know, like, well, I'd like for this to change. But to be really clear about what you would like to see happen um, before you even begin. Mm -hmm. So you can meditate on that, contemplate that, and then... um, see it happening for you. So, for example, I um, moved to this part of the country about a year ago. And when I did, and I settled down here in our home and um, was visioning our new center, I was very clear that, you know, it. I would like to see this and that, and I'd like it to have a, a separate space for meditation, and I'd like it to be in a part of town where people don't have to look for us to find us, that we're right on the main drag, that there's a mix of cultures in the community. You know, I was very um, clear. And then I brought it down into a simple phrase, um, a place where people can find the path of Kriya Yoga, embark upon it, and have community. Mm. But within that simple phrase, 
is all of the things I just mentioned. So I have all of that visioning in my mind. So when you sit to meditate, you can float this in Om. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to when you're um, developing your affirmation, it doesn't have to include all those things, but in your mind's eye, see it out picturing for you whatever the goal is or whatever the transformation is. If you're trying to invite something into your life, that's a little different. Mm. Um, that is not landing on the exact thing that you want, but what, what the energy and support of that thing will do for you. So when I was trying to bring my um, partner into my life, I was not looking for a partner. I was actually, this is going long, but... <laughs> That's okay. It's wonderful. ...for um, supportive presence in my life. I didn't um, say what it needed to look like, but I, I was a little bit struggling with like overwhelm and I felt I needed support. I didn't care what it looked like, but I knew God knew what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And then this beautiful person came into my life and we became really fast spiritual friends. And she was so supportive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me use the word, but you know, I ended up marrying her and she is my rock right now. And I remember the prayer was, you know, spirit, I um, am inviting support and and if I am to ever be married, it has to be a spiritual marriage. Mm -hmm. And both came. Mm -hmm. So That's lovely. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yes. So clarity. Clarity clarity and clarity and trust, would you say? Would those be yes. kind of the clarity, the faith things? and yeah. Excellent. And trust. Lovely. Um, well, before we before we come to the end of our, our interview today, uh, I'm curious, do you have any um, advice for individuals on the spiritual path? Now, anything that's been on your mind or anything that you, you think is important to share uh, with those who are, are practicing Kriya Yoga and meditation? Yeah, something that's been on my mind, which is probably on many people's minds, is, you know, out in this day and age, all of the information about everything that's going on in the world can meet us right in our homes, on our computers, you know, on our phones, walking around with us. We know everything as it happens. And many things that get highlighted are um, troublesome, worrying, um, painful, mm -hmm. because that's just what makes it to the top of the list, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it can feel heavy and disheartening. And for those of us on the path, I encourage us to practice deeply, stay focused on what we know to be true, which is, and I'm going to have to quote Roy Jean Davis here, is that there is a power for good operating in the universe, and we can learn to cooperate with it and to stay focused on that. To also do what you can to share the teachings with others because this is what we need is more, more, more people connected with themselves and their, their spirituality and with their soul guidance. Um, and then our world will be awakening more fully. Well, thank you. That's perfect. Perfectly said. So um, thank you for being with us here today. We really, really appreciate it. It was great to be with you. I look forward to seeing you again in person someday. Yes, we're not very far away. So as you know, we talked about before the uh, session began, we might have to work on a an, an East Coast Kriya Yoga gathering. So let's 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 see that. Let's float that in Om. I see it. I see it. Excellent. Okay. So our guest today is Reverend Priya Friday Pabros, um, a Kriya Yoga teacher, a founder and director of Thrive Kriya Yoga Meditation Center in Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, I will put the contact information and um, websites for Reverend Priya um, in the section below the podcast and also the section below this video. So again, thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me too.
This episode of the Kriya Yoga podcast was made possible by donations from Kriya Yoga apprenticeship students and supporters of our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Kriya Yoga.